Okay, for the sake of time, I'm gonna get started here. Um, welcome everyone to the Hearing the Divorce, Diverse Voices of the AAEA. On behalf of the AAEA Mentoring Committee, I want to thank you for joining us during this probably especially busy time for many of you. Um, before we get started, I do wanna thank the AAEA office, specifically Austin and Allison who are on here today for their assistance in organizing and advertising today's session. So with the limited time we have, and we have four wonderful panelists, I just want to remind you that we're gonna hear about uh, people's stories. This is the whole purpose of these uh, sessions. And we're gonna learn about where they are in their career now, how they got there professionally, and what experiences or forces shaped them in their career that might not be evidence in their CVs or resumes. So our first person today is Dr. Luis Peña Lovano, and he is an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Wisconsin River Falls and Dairy Innovation Hub faculty in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics at the University of Wisconsin Madison. He is also the chair of the international section of the AAEA. His areas of expertise include climate change, international trade, optimization programming, agricultural finance, and labor economics. Louise has also taught econometrics at the graduate level and upper undergraduate level courses that include financial management, microeconomics, international trade, contemporary issues in agribusiness, among others. So Louise, please go ahead and share your experiences. Do you like to share the screen? Um, I should, I mean, I, I'm right now having the video connected. Okay. So, well, uh, thank you very much everybody for, for joining today. And so in this case, um, I wanted to mention a couple of experiences that have shaped the way that actually I'm doing my career. As uh, many of my colleagues that are here right now, I want to actually to, to thank several of them for coming and joining today too. Um, in my case, if I can give a message about um, so far how I'm doing in my career, I would actually could summarize it in three different points. The first one is the importance of a mentor. So in my case, uh, when I was finishing my, my PhD and I started my early career, Unfortunately, I lost my major professor due to an illness, Dr. Wallace Steiner, who was actually one of the uh, best persons that I have ever met. So during the time, um, it was difficult for me to project where I actually wanted to go and actually what were the correct procedures to actually move. And that is where actually uh, I got the support of three important people in my life who are actually my mentors at the moment, Dr. Escalanter, Dr. Uh, Belmar, and Dr. Marshall. And thanks to that support, I feel that my trajectory as a career has changed significantly because I have been trying to uh, follow their advice in terms of extension, research, and teaching. And I think one thing that I had to, that I was able to collect from each of them is their experiences and what actually I could do better. So the first message I could say is actually to stay always humble that even though you are actually going into your career, there will be also storms that you're gonna face, but uh, the key of a mentor can actually help you to actually move. Uh, second, um, in that regard is network. So far um, in the last 12 months, my team have been awarded five grants and I will not attribute it at all, that is only my success. It has been also because I have been able to connect with each of my teammates and try to understand what actually are their strengths and, and my weaknesses, and how do we can complement each other in each of the paths that we need in order to solve this, uh, any type of issue. Of course, at the beginning, it's not easy to try to, to, to create a network, but and I think uh, that is something that I must mention. Sometimes conferences, and in most cases, conferences, meeting new people and trying to always talk to someone um, gives you the, the, the connections that you may need in the future. Although even if you don't actually think that it's actually going to end up in that way. Many of my friends actually have it, uh, and I, we actually started to collaborate um, in a very nonchalant way. One day we were, for example, having a, a drink together and then one of those ideas is how it started. My, my very first grant actually started because I was working out with one of them, for example, and it, it turned out to be a successful project. 
And the third uh, point that, uh, that has been in my career, and I think at the same time, it aligns with the two of them, is to try to build mental resilience. One thing as an early career that I had been facing, and I imagine that many of you um, have too, and according to what I have seen, for example, in Twitter and in other media, is the pressure of trying to be successful while at the same time being human beings that will actually face different paths in life. And that is something that is actually difficult to manage. And the first thing I have to mention is everybody passes it. So if you ever feel like that, don't think that you are the only person that is suffering from something. Every of us actually have different points in our life that are gonna go in a happy state or in a, or in a very challenging state because of family, because of relations, because of friendship, because of profession. But the only thing is try not to stay alone. Being alone is not sometimes the answer. And you will find in, at the same time that you're gonna find amazing friends, um, an amazing, for example, uh, other half that will help you to actually go into, in, help you to move at the same time with your family and with other um, people that you will connect in the future. Uh, so with those three elements, I think that actually I can summarize what I have been doing in, and how actually it has been my life. Um, trying to, I'm actually, and I can say that I'm really grateful actually for the connections that I have made so far. And in my case, the strengths that I have is actually thanks to all of the people that I that actually are around me. So I remember someone asked me why I always smiling, and I can say that it's a genuine smile, and it's because I couldn't be happier. Um, I think that I have found where I feel uh, that I belong, and that is I feel the key in order to actually continue working in what I like, because what I do actually every day. I really enjoy it. Um, and not only the work, but also the people that I work with. So the last thing that I want to mention is try to find the work environment that you feel that is actually right to. And once you find it, you will notice that everything is much easier. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Louise. We appreciate that. Um, we are gonna have some time at the end for questions here, but I'm gonna continue on to the next speaker. Um, Amy. So Amy Ando is a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in the Department of Ag and Consumer Economics. She's also a university fellow at Resources for the Future. Ando's research focuses primarily on the economics of nature conservation, ecosystem service values, and environmental justice. She currently has grants from the NSF, USDA, and the, Nat the Natural Resources Defense Council and has published in journals such as Science, The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, JAERE, and GEEM. Ando is currently a co-editor for the AJAE, an elected member of the Board of Agricultural and Applied Economics Association, and a member of the Board on Agricultural and Natural Resources of the National Academies. Amy, would you like to share your screen? Okay, I'll stop sharing. Do I have to share my screen if I don't have slides? No, okay, you great. You don't have to. Good, because <laughs> um, all I have is just words, uh, and that's I'll just speak them instead of showing them. Uh, so thanks for having me, and and thanks for hosting this really interesting uh, series. I think it's it's a nice thing, and I, I took the assignment quite literally. So I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and what I'm doing now, but also more of a tale of how I got here. So currently, as you heard from that little bio, I research and teach natural resource and environmental economics. I'm a full professor in the Ag Econ department here at UIUC, which is an R1 land grant university in the Midwest. I will actually be moving this summer to be the chair of the Department of Ag, Environmental and Development Economics at Ohio State, go Buckeyes. And, um, and I do a variety of leadership type things, the co-editor position boards and stuff like that. But how did I get here, right? Um, and, you know, I'm always, wow, I'm a senior person now. How did, how did that happen? Um, I am not from the Midwest. I am from Massachusetts. Um, and I did not grow up in the land grant system at all. I got my undergraduate degree from a liberal arts college from Williams College, which, which is in the Northwest corner of Massachusetts. And I got my PhD from MIT, 
um, and both of those degrees were in economics, but regular mainstream economics, not ag econ. Um, I got my PhD in 1996 through sheer tenacity and stubbornness. <laughs> there were no faculty at MIT in the area in which I wanted to work. There were no field classes in environmental and resource economics. My field classes were in industrial organization and public finance because those were the closest things. And I had no real mentors. Um, it took me ages to develop a dissertation plan. Uh, I was told I should be all about cars because that was the closest to environment stuff that people at MIT were interested in, but I didn't want to do that. So I wrote my dissertation on the Endangered Species Act and they didn't really know what to do with me. Um, it was a miracle I finished. I think they probably didn't think I would finish. Um, I finished as a non-resident graduate student living in Virginia, hosted by the friendly faculty in the econ department at the University of Virginia, to whom I am forever grateful <laughs> for giving me a remote home. Uh, but then things changed and my first job, it was a great good fortune. My first job was at Resources for the Future, which was this amazing group of environmental and natural resource economists. And so finally, I had colleagues in my field and I began developing a professional network um, in the Association for Environmental and Resource Economists. And I stayed there for three years. Um, Still in Washington, that was Washington, D.C., so that was all on the East Coast. How, how am I here? What led me to go West or Midwest, as the case may be? Um, my husband's a mathematician. Uh, he has always been hugely supportive of my career, but it was hard for us to solve the two-body academic problem in the Washington area, and the University of Illinois had a good partner hiring program. Here... So remember, I didn't even know AgEcon existed. I had been in mainstream economics my whole life, but at Illinois, the economics department, they were like, oh, we don't do environmental. We're not interested in hiring this person. Fortunately, there was this other department, Ag and Consumer Economics, and they were looking for someone to teach environmental economics. So they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll hire this person. I don't, you know, MIT, I don't know about that, but okay, she could teach this class, she'll be all right. Um, and so that's how I'm here. Uh, and I've built a strong career here. It has been a good place for me to be. If I think about how I developed my career, if I think about themes, and I hate to do this because what works for one person doesn't work for another person. People are in different situations, um, have different personalities, different interests. And I also think there's a lot of survivor bias, like, oh yes, you should do this because it worked for me, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it would work for someone else. But um, one theme is to do the best you can with wherever you are. Um, so here I was at the University of Illinois, and I really learned to embrace and genuinely value a lot about the land grant system. I was new to it. And, you know, sometimes uh, converts are the most zealous. <laughs> so I've really grown to love the whole culture of engagement that informs research rather than just sitting at my desk, looking at journal articles and you know, getting out and talking to people. And I've really enjoyed doing things like being on advisory boards for the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and stuff like that. And so now I'm very connected with the AAEA um, because that became uh, you know, as much one of my professional associations as ARI, and I really value this community of, of researchers. Um, I was an undergraduate at a tiny liberal arts college with all small classes, but here I've really learned to appreciate the opportunity to teach large classes and having the opportunity to work with students from all walks of life. Um, and knowing that when I, the work I do there has impact on more than just a few people. And I really embraced and love living here in this community, um, in this part of the country I did not come from. And I have very deep roots here now. It's making the move, the upcoming move a little bit hard, to be honest. Um, so that's one thing, you know, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, do the best you can, make it work. Um, build connections. So I'm actually a very shy person. What am I doing talking in a webinar to a bunch of people? It's just, but, but even if you're shy like me, find ways to build connections. Attending smaller conferences were most valuable to me when I first started out um, and, and kind of continued to be so. Um, and so those are often good opportunities to, to make meaningful connections with people. Um, 
You can also, so I, one of the things I did here that I've most valued was to be the lead organizer of the Heartland Workshop. So not just going to events other people have, but hosting them yourself. And I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are graduate students and junior faculty coming through the Heartland Workshop I've stayed in touch with over the years. Um, you know, I, I would have had an easier time in grad school if I did what I was supposed to and did the fields that were popular, but that wasn't what I wanted to do. And that has worked for me. So do things that you love and keep balance in your life. So I stayed true to my research passions and that meant that I always really cared about what I was doing and that got me through hard times. Um, I had a family with two kids and that kept me grounded. Um, so I, I think that those things are important for for you know, making all of it work. Um, it, often, actually, sometimes people will ask me about barriers because I'm a woman in economics and there aren't very many of us. I'm a full professor and there are even fewer of those. I'm not going to talk a lot about barriers, um, although as a woman in economics, they have popped up periodically ever since uh, I started my PhD program. When they've appeared, I have just navigated around them after being angry or sad or both. Um, I personally have found it important not to dwell too much on them because that uses up a huge amount of bandwidth and energy. And so, you know, if there's a wall in the way, be mad at it, but then get around it and, and don't let it live rent free in your head <laughs> and and be an ongoing barrier just by using up energy that you could be spending doing things you care about. Um, so, you know, navigating around them, you know, I, I, I have found it, you know, not dwelling on them is, is one thing, but also over time as issues have come up, um, having a long-term strategy to keep moving myself into situations where I and my work are respected and, and I can thrive, that's important um, because you know everybody deserves to be in a situation where they're respected and, and able to, to work fully as themselves. And so you know earlier I said do the best you can with where you are and that's certainly true. But if you're you know, if that's not working, um, you know, finding ways eventually to 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 shift gears a little bit. Uh, and it doesn't need to be a whole move. It could just be, you know, within where you are, slightly changing the work you do or how you do it. Um, that can be enough to make a difference. So I have found all of those to be useful strategies. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. So I'm going to share my screen again. Our next uh, panelist is Sierra Howry. Sierra graduated from East Central University in Oklahoma with a BS in mathematics and as a McNair alumnus. She then attended Oklahoma State University where she attained a master's in economics and a PhD in agricultural economics. Sierra started teaching college classes as a graduate teaching assistant at OSU where her love of teaching really grew. Sierra started her career and taught for five years at Angelo State University in St. Angelo, Texas. She has been at the University of Wisconsin River Falls for the last 10 years. For the last five years, she has been the McNair director and last year became full professor. Congrats, Sierra. Sierra, would you like to share a screen at all? No. Nope. Okay, I'll just all right. stop this. And... So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I don't know that I've got as much prepared as some of you guys do. I really kind of go off the cuff a lot, but a um, couple of things that, uh, a little bit about my story. Um, so I have, um, I'm a first gen uh, from a low income background. Uh, remember growing up as a kid, my my dad was really excited when he could make five when he could make seven hundred dollars a month to uh, for my family. So my sister, my mom, and I um, grew up kind of on a farm. We rented a place, so I was around animals, but that was about it. Certainly couldn't afford them. Um, but I think growing up as a first generation college student really helped set a lot for me in my life. Um, I also have a learning disability. I have dyslexia. It wasn't diagnosed until I was in fourth grade. Um, when it was diagnosed, they informed me that I would never graduate high school. Um, my, I have to say my heroes are my parents because they said, you're going to graduate. And we're not going to listen to them. And, and which is interesting because my mom is in the medical field, right? And she really highly respects people's opinions. Um, 
But uh, so I had to work really hard through school. Um, I love mathematics, obviously. Um, I struggle with the rest. Uh, then I go on to graduate undergrad there at East Central University. And I was um, really fortunate that I found the McNair program. Well, they found me. I was a female in a STEM program uh, when they found out that I was first generation, low income, Native American, checked all the boxes really well. Um, they started talking about grad school. And I was like, grad school? I'm not supposed to graduate high school, much less college, right? Um, it was interesting, though. I wanted to be a math teacher and a golf coach because uh, we ended up buying a driving range when I was um, in uh, middle school. And so I thought, that's what I need to do. Well, um, you know, the good Lord sometimes have different plans for you because I never made my way over to the teaching part, the teaching college. Um, and so it was a semester before graduation to realize that I was supposed to apply into the program. I wanted to become a teacher. I was going to have three more semesters to go through the student teaching program. And I was almost completely done with my degree. And so um, I seen a little three by five index card that says assistantships and statistics at Oklahoma State University. And this was in um, like October. So I call them up. Um, they said, yeah, come up, visit. So I did. And so in the fall, I mean, in the, yeah, sorry, in the spring I started, which is again, unique because most people start fall cohorts. They don't even have spring. So I started at Oklahoma State. I walked in, taught my very, now. They handed me a book, they handed me a sort of a syllabus and said, good luck. And that's that was my training to be a, a teacher of a class. Um, I, I, I knew then this is what I had to do and I didn't know how I was gonna get it done. I didn't know how I was gonna pay for all this. I didn't know how I was gonna be able to get this accomplished. Again, I'm not supposed to graduate high school. So why am I in grad school? And I had a lot of struggles with that um, because my writing is pretty poor. Uh, even though I work on it, even though I worked on it, um, and that that did not help. Um, so I went to school for about two and a half years in statistics, um, didn't pass their comprehensive exams, um, made my way over to economics, um, finished up a um, master's in economics. Um, they, they said, I went over there and I applied. I said, hey, I'm looking for another graduate college. And there's there's a little bit more reasons behind that, but another graduate department. I said, you know how to do math? I said, uh-huh. They said, come on. Right. So if you guys know anything about economics, we could teach you the rest, but the math is somewhat a lot more difficult. Right. And so um, fell in love with economics and knew then that I really wanted to go on for a PhD. Um, took me another eight years. Uh, again, not passing the comps are, are, are pretty, pretty difficult to do uh, for me. And um, finally got my master's, went on into a PhD in agricultural economics. And I had Dr. Art Stoker as my mentor. Lovely, awesome man. Uh, however, he was not one to necessarily tell you what your life path should be, right? Um, and so one of the things that I had to learn very quickly is how to surround myself with people that were interested in what I wanted to be successful in. Um, I also had a, a, a boyfriend that followed me to Oklahoma State became a husband, also working on his PhD. Um, so again, I totally understand the, the two, two uh, degree households that can be very difficult to find a job. So I ended up taking a position at Angelo State. Lovely school, great school. I was the only ag economist in a department of agriculture, mostly animal science. Um, that was a struggle, um, but I grew the department and that was what was important. I think the love for my students and what I showed them made a difference. I grew the department from 25 students to almost 100 in less than five years that I was there. Uh, I think that that's a testament to when you pour yourself into people, it can pay off. Um, the only downside is, is that I was the only ag economist and it, it become a little much. And I really wanted a department that was had more people that were like minded like me. Um, and so then that's when I, this position come open at um, University of Wisconsin River Falls. Now I am from the South. I, I like the warm and I'm up here in the cold tundra. I'm telling you, I, I would really like to see 50 degrees. I mean, this would be great this year, please, please, at some point. Um, 
but I've been up here now 10 years. Um, and I, one of the things that I would leave anybody is to get on committees, get on those committees, whether they be in your department, whether they be in your college or in your associations. Um, so I was part of TLC from the AAEA, went up through those chairs. I loved, loved doing that. I've always had a quiz bowl team working again with those students, bringing them to the AAEA and the SAEA, um, working on those committees. Watching my students make a difference in the world has made all the difference for me, even though it was there was times I wanted to quit 10 years of graduate school and I wanted to quit. I wanted to get out. Um, I'm so glad. I'm so, so glad I didn't. Um, so summer's coming on and my husband almost always asks me in around August, are you about ready for school to start? Cause I'm ready for you to go back. And that is because I get a lot of energy and a lot of satisfaction or utility from my students um, and I think that that's what makes that, I mean, we got to find the place that makes you the happiest and then, and then build from there. The other thing I really love about my department, Luis is in my department, but we have probably one of the most diverse departments on our campus. Um, so, uh, Amy, we actually have three females that are, that are all um, either tenured or, well, all of us are tenured and, and some of us are full faculty, um, we have one individual that is born American and the rest, the other three, four, we've got a fourth one coming on, are from different countries. Um, so we have an eight faculty department. Um, having that diversity in our department has really been a blessing, um, not only for me to learn, but for our students, right? And that's that's been really neat. So if I can leave you with anything, make for sure you find those committees that can make you better right? Um, don't get on the sinking ship ones. We all know those. Um, but find the ones that can make you you better. Jason gave me a chance to be on the um, AETR uh, editorial board. Uh, somebody that has a, a difficulty writing like I do, I thought, I've got to jump on this, right? This is absolutely something I've got to do. Um, and And really figure out what makes you happy and then just stick with it. So... That's what I have to share. Thank you, Sierra. We appreciate it. So next up, we have Jason Bergtold. So Jason is a professor and Kaufman Distinguished Teaching Scholar in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University. He earned his PhD at Virginia Tech and has been at K-State since 2008. He has a passion for teaching, teaching classmen, classes at the freshman to PhD level. He has been recognized for his excellent teaching by Kansas State University, AAEA, WAEA, and USDA. He has a productive research program supported by external grants examining conservation across agricultural landscapes, land use economics, bioenergy, renewable energy, rural community resilience, and teaching scholarship. Welcome, Jason. So thank you. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm, I'm coming on the tail end, so I'll, I'll try to keep mine a little short too. Um, in terms of kind of following along with what our other um, distinguished um, speakers have talked about. Um, so my background is just quickly, I, I, I did not, I wanted to be a teacher in undergrad, kind of got um, talking with professors and I went to Colorado State University and talking with my professors, I really kind of found out I want to teach at the college level. That's what led me to, which I think is a little unique in the sense that um, I wanted to be a teacher first and foremost. And so that led me to knowing I needed to get a PhD and I fell in love with research kind of along the way. And so I, I did my graduate at Virginia Tech from 99, graduated in 2004, went into a really rough job market, um, so I ended up taking a job with the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Auburn, Alabama, on the Auburn University campus. And what was cool there was I got to be an affiliate faculty in the Ag Econ department there. Um, and then in 2008, um, I, I came to, as an assistant professor at Kansas State, and I moved up the ranks um, since then. Um, and, and I've had the unique opportunity. I teach our principals course, our large section principals course to our freshmen, 
um, as well all the way up to PhD field courses. So um, I, I kind of get to see all those students at the different levels. Um, and in terms of things that I, I guess adding on what people have already added, stressing, um, I'll kind of hit a few things here. The first one is I, I can't stress enough um, mentorship. But beyond just um, finding kind of building that as your grad student with your major professor or other professors in your department, it's also becoming um, finding mentors in that first job, finding people who are like-minded, who can build you up, that you can walk in and talk to about issues um, and building those relationships. And they, at your institution, as well as across our profession, and, and I'll second what Sierra said, a great way to do that is getting involved in committees um, and any associations. And so you can find like-minded people and, and just talking with people and um, building those networks. Because I think having those mentors can give you guidance in your career when you do feel lost. And so that, that's really helped me at different points um, in my career, seeing where, what path I wanted to take. Along that same lines though, I also want to say one of the things that I, I found a little bit too is also make sure you're an advocate for yourself. And so make sure that you, you have self-advocacy, that you are pushing your own um, kind of what you do well. And um, it, it, it's not about bragging or saying, hey, I, I, I'm the best at this. It, it, it's more saying, um, making sure you're building those relationships and asserting yourself into teams. and um, offering this and kind of educating people about the skills that our discipline offers um, and building into research teams. And, and that kind of leads to my second point and something that really changed my path after graduate school was my first job at Agriculture Research Service was working. I was the only ag economist in our lab. Um, I did have some connecting being on the Auburn University campus, but I was housed in a USDA facility. And I worked with five other research scientists in conservation cropping systems. And so I worked with ag engineers, um, weed scientists, soil scientists, agronomists, um, and as an interdisciplinary team. And um, I was thrown headfirst into an extension type role that I had to learn and do um, and with a lot of travel, but also doing research, really working with other disciplines and learning that language and those languages of those disciplines, which I think has been invaluable in my career because I continue to working in interdisciplinary teams to this day. Most of my grants from the, are from the National Science Foundation um, or USDA, and they're on interdisciplinary teams. And so, um, and, and I purposely try to seek out those projects. I think that's kind of, I, I have a vision in my head that this is kind of where higher education is leading down the down the long term, um, but also the power behind building up those kind of jumping into that type of research and what it's brought for me. So it's not just that I get to do interdisciplinary research. I bring in new skills from other disciplines that I can bring to my students, but it's also opened up new ways for me to think about how I teach, um, how I reach out. Um, and how I engage um, different audiences. Um, and so um, it's been really exciting trying to bring that into the classroom um, and trying to even bring other methods into the classroom, even into an econ class at say the principal's level. I, I think one of the, a third thing that kind of comes for me is um, in your career, especially if you're in a teaching or even a research position where you're interacting with students, engage those students, especially in something I, I came to do a little bit late is engage undergrads. Um, something that I've started doing a lot within the last few years um, is I, I still men mentor graduate students. I, I think get on graduate committees, mentor grad students. I learn as much from them as I do, do mentoring them. And, and that builds lifelong partnerships. Um, and networks, but I think as well as I've started really starting to bring in, um, I hire about six to seven undergrads a semester right now to act as undergraduate researchers on my grant projects, as well as um, teaching assistants in my classrooms. And so that has really opened up the ability for um, 
me to start seeing my classes from a different point of view, which is really unique because my students can provide a much different perspective and they hear a lot of different feedback. In addition, what's really cool there is I think I've gotten some, I, I have work from undergrads that to me rivals what I sometimes get from master's students. Um, our best undergrads, we should be tapping them for research projects. Um, and whether they're an honor student or not. And so that's been something that has been really rewarding um, and being able to have them go out and do engagement opportunities, publishing with them and so on. Um, and, and also make sure you are mentoring with the grad students in your programs um, when those opportunities um, come about. The other, I, I think the last thing I'll say and more for teaching is, and, and, and I, I am the editor of the Applied Te Economics Teaching Resources. And I, I think one of the things that I, I love meeting with my editorial board, um, but something else that brings that up, that one of the benefits of that is keeping engaging in discussions about teaching. Um, I, I think one thing I, I've learned is we always can be better teachers. We always can be better researchers. And I think one of the ways we do that is to engage in discussions about that, not just kind of hide out in our offices, um, but purposefully um, doing that. So setting up discussion times in your department or with colleagues, um, attending the TLC sessions on Fridays, um, where you can learn and um, just talk about teaching, talk about research, engagement, working with students. Um, and these issues. And I, I, I think that's how we build ourselves up and being more active about that. I, I, I think one thing I've seen is we don't do that enough in our departments. Um, and, and I think we tend to see it across the profession a bit, but I encourage you start those dialogues and be the person who initiated it. Um, and those can be really powerful and open up new pathways and tools and stuff that we haven't thought of. And so I, I, I'll, I'll leave you with that and um, turn it back over to Alicia. Thank you, Jason. And thank you to all of our panelists. We have the remaining time, which is about 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you're comfortable joining on live and asking your questions, feel free to do that. If not, if you wanna throw it in the chat, I'm happy to read those to our panelists. I do wanna share that Louise did have a timing conflict. So he had to leave us and he wanted to say thank you for letting him share some of his story um, today. So any questions? Raise your hand if you have one. I have backups so to get us started if we need to. Yoko, go ahead. All right, hi. Um, Jason, I was really curious about how, how, what's one way that you initiated a conversation about teaching? Was there some topics that, I, I'm just wondering what that looks like and if you could give an example of that. I, I think in terms of, so we had a new hire in our department and for me, it was talking with him, um, but also in, in engaging and he's actually leading it, um, but having an idea of saying, hey, why don't we, there are people who are struggling with teaching, right? Learning it or relearning it, I, I think sometimes um, with classes. And, and I think one of the things, how that came up was, um, we all can improve. And I, I think it came out of a discussion with a colleague, a new one, and it came out of one of just saying, let's pick a book. And what we ended up doing was forming a small group where we're actually working ourselves, we're walking ourselves through a book about teaching chapter by chapter, kind of every two weeks. And so we meet every two weeks for an hour, an hour and a half. And the idea is, and people in our department have talked about it for a while, getting a group together, but kind of getting to that was someone just taking and saying, hey, I'm scheduled, literally I'm scheduling a meeting. Everyone in the department, we invited everyone. We know it's gonna be a small group just because of timing conflicts, but just getting that kind of, that discussion started. Um, and so that was the big, that, that was how we started it. It was kind of built off, there was a need but I think what was really cool was I, I kind of going after that, it was kind of like we should have done this years ago and had this group going, even if it's once a month or every every other week. And I know other people have done that as well. 
those kind of teaching groups. And that, that's an easy way to start. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for answering that. Cesar. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much to all those who shared your, their stories, wonderful stories and wonderful insights. My question has something to do with my recent in conversation with a, with a faculty member here from the University of Georgia, a female faculty member. And um, her, she shared with me her experiences about um, whenever she teaches, there were like instances when there's like certain students who actually would try to um, display some sort of superiority in the classroom, mainly because she is a female teacher and that there's some, some sort of like uh, an effort to, to, to uh, embarrass her or to make her feel like she's, she's less knowledgeable than them. I'm, I'm expecting that that's like an isolated case, but I just want to ask specifically Amy and, and Sierra about that. So Cesara, I'll, I'll start. <clears throat> I have to say that uh, I don't know how, how old she is. Um, as I've gotten older, uh, I have less of that happening. So when I first started teaching, um, I had a group of guys that sat in the back of the room. Um, oh, they hackled me pretty, pretty good. Um, to, to the point that I threatened to kick them out. I was done. I was, I'm done. So it's not isolated by any means. Um, I, I told you my husband was also working on his PhD. So I had him come in and sit in a classroom during exams because I found that they were trying to cheat and other things. And, and so, and it was just a large class. I mean, it was hard to manage as one person. So, um, all of a sudden when they walked in, it was like, they were a whole different group of people. And that was very, very frustrating. So um, it's not isolated. One of the things that um, I do to minimize some of that is that I come off kind of strong day one. Like, I don't, I don't mean to tell you I'm smarter than you, but I'm going to tell you I am. Right? I'm going to make it very clear. The other thing I make sure that they do, and I started this pretty early, they all call me Dr. Howery. I don't, I'm not going to let them call me Sierra. When they graduate, absolutely fantastic, right? But I, I have that across the board. Um, and that, even though everybody in my fact, every single person in my department calls each other by, and their students by the first name, not me. So that, that may be one. Let me just give that as a suggestion. My name is Dr. Howery, and you are welcome to call me Dr. Howery. So Amy, I, I know that you totally have. agree with yes, and, and and it was worse when I was younger. Um, I and I wish that my hair had gone gray faster, to be <laughs> honest, because I still get mixed up with graduate students. Um, and and there were times when, um, like you know, the person who was director of graduate studies at the time when I was a brand new assistant professor undermined me <laughs> around the graduate students, which is not helpful. Um, so. I, I mean, I think Sarah's suggestions were really good, um, you know, and it's ridiculous that women have to do this, but, you know, coming off for forcefully dressing professionally, um, insisting on using full name and title, um, those are strategies. I also have an extremely long, extremely complete syllabus for every class I teach with all contingencies, and there are no exceptions. Um, if there are, you know, I have, I will drop your three lowest grades. All It's 10 pages long and those are the rules and they are non-negotiable from day one. Um, it's, it's unfortunate and, you know, but we're, we're happy to talk with other women who've gone through it and it does get better as you get older, <laughs> which is silly, but um, it, she's not alone. Well, thank you so much. Um, I would have my own uh, version of the same experiences from another perspective, but that's another for another time to discuss. This is different not kinds of disrespect, right? It's all <laughs> out there, yep. But also, well, that ends well. Hmm. Cesar, let me let me throw this out there. You have my email because you've come up and seen me. She is welcome to reach out to any of us, but she's absolutely welcome to reach out to me. I will be happy to sit down and have a conversation. Um, Na and I have had a few, haven't we, Na? So if we need to have conversations, that is one thing. I didn't mention, but I didn't have a mentor, but I make sure I mentor young faculty, especially females in our field. I'm not the only one. I know others do that, but feel free. 
Thank you. I'll definitely pass on your information to her. Thank you. Okay, well, we have a hand raised. I'm sorry, your name is not there. It all defaulted to Austin's name for several people. So we have several Austin Sparbles on here. There really is only one, but go ahead and ask your question. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. This is Na from University of Arizona. And uh, I'm sorry I missed the first uh, half an hour. I think I missed all the wonderful stories of our wonderful panelists. Um, my question is very general to uh, all of our panelists. Um, that uh, when do you know that it's time for you to change? Uh, change with respect to, I know that all our panelists is a kind of a traditional way of split research, teaching and extension, maybe different roles in academia. Uh, how do you know it's time to change? That's first question. And second question, I guess is also very general, is uh, what would be one example that you will do differently in your career that you think you can share and uh, we can learn from uh, you guys? Uh, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and I, I'll add this. Now, I don't know that it, you'll always know when it's the right time. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But I heard a speaker say this the other day, and I think it's true, that if somebody from your association is asking you to apply for a job in their department because they love their department that well, they think you would be a good fit for their department, I say apply. You may not take it, but don't turn down opportunities that are handed to you. And that is one thing that I think is important for everybody. Don't turn down opportunities that are potentially handed to you. So I, I, that is, I'll leave it at that. I know Amy's about to leave where she's at, so maybe she can have a little bit more insight to it, and Jason as well, so. Um, honestly, the, the thing that, and I've, I've made changes even to my work, just even here within Illinois, um, things, you know, emphases, and I've done some time doing part-time administration. Part of me is just, you know, I get bored. <laughs> I, I, I mean, not, not, and I, I say that flippantly, but you know, I, I'm not the kind of person who wants to do the same thing and do, uh, day after day. And, um, and, you know, when you get excited about doing something a little bit different or you feel like, wow. So in my case, I, I just end up doing a lot of organization. I'm organized and so on and so forth. It's like, you know, I think it might be kind of interesting to, to be a department head or chair. And, you know, OSU is like, hey, why don't you apply? And, and so, you know, Sierra's suggestion is, is a good one. But, um, but also just when you get that feeling like I've, I've learned everything, maybe this is a positive way to think about it. I've learned everything I can learn from what I'm currently doing in the place where I am. And it doesn't mean that there's anything bad about that, but it's an opportunity to do something new and learn something new and make different contributions. Um, so just, I actually, people hate annual reports. I love annual reports. I love sitting down once a year and saying, this is what I've done and this is what I think I'm gonna do. Like taking some time periodically to reflect on what you're doing, what's your trajectory, it's healthy and it gives you an opportunity to, to have those thoughts. I'll kind of, I, uh, ditto to the last two speakers in terms of, um, I, I, I think the other, I'll, I'll mention one thing and I think it's kind of, because I, I totally agree with what Sierra said, if those opportunities arise, um, if it's something you would consider, Yes, apply, go through it because you don't. I, I think what some people don't realize is you don't have to say yes. Um, remember, an interview and applying for jobs is you're you're exploring. Um, the, the other side of that too is, um, and I agree with Amy's side too. For me, it, it's as you come to different spots and you're like, I need to take something new on. Um, I love being an editor. I. It's something for me that was, I love that process and organizing that. And I'm like, I've even thought about what's after AETR. I mean, and continuing that. And I, I like the role. And so finding that role. I, I think the other side of that is talk with people as well. Um, and so if you're thinking about positions, 
reach out to them. I, I think a lot of us are, I'm shy when it comes to that as well, especially if it's colleagues. Um, I, I'm better at groups I don't know, but when it comes to my colleagues and peers, I tend to be a lot shyer and more reserved. And so from that perspective, I, I think it, it's talk with them in terms of like initiating those discussions, like reaching out saying, hey, can I set up a meeting to talk with you? I mean, even if it, and saying, if you're thinking about being a department head, I, I, I think, cause um, I'm almost at that point in my career too, where that, and Amy, congrats. I, I think where that starts coming up um, and people start approaching you and thinking about that. And, and from that perspective, it's really talking with those people um, and just having a discussion. What does this involve? Because I think a lot of us, we don't know, like admin. I don't think you really know until you jump into it. And that, that way you don't jump in and then you're like, oh no, I don't want to do this, right? And then it's hard to jump out as quick, right? And so um, have those discussions early on. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. We had a question come in on my direct message to me. So I'm gonna ask it for the person. He said, as a recent graduate and a newbie in the academic world, any advice on how to overcome and deal daily with the imposter syndrome when you are working maybe in a small department and maybe not developing new econometric methods? So I'm gonna jump in here and tell you that you got a PhD. You, you're not an imposter. No, they don't hand that out. That is not easy to get. So you just take that and just pitch it, pitch it. Um, I, I, I had it all the way through. Again, first gen, low income, never supposed to graduate. And then I finally had to look up one day and say, you know what? I did it. I did it. You did it. You, you were equal to everybody on this phone call. You are equal, right? Yeah, now we're climbing, you know, you're climbing your career, making your changes, making your pieces. You could, you, you got it. So congratulations as a new graduate, Gra congratulations. Well said, and I agree with that. A couple concrete strategies. Um, you mentioned, you know, maybe not up to date on econometric skills, but um, reflecting that everybody brings something different to this work that we do. And some people are all too, like I, because I went to a liberal arts college, I was not mathematically trained at all. I got to MIT and I almost died in the first year. Oh, it was so hard. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know how to do any of this, but I am a really good writer and I'm very good at big picture thinking. And those have been my comparative advantages throughout my entire career. And, you know, everybody, some people have uh, uh, real world knowledge, whatever, you know, just what, what's your thing and, and focus on that rather than what is somebody else's comparative advantage. Another strategy that I've heard people use that is useful. Anytime you get positive feedback, whether it's an email or a student evaluation, make a folder, put that there. And then on a day when you're having that imposter syndrome day, go look at the folder. I even printed some of them out and I put them near my computer. It was just like on the wall. <laughs> so like, oh, this person said a nice thing about me in an email, I, and now I can just look at it. So, you know, we all have those days. I, I still sometimes have imposter syndrome. <laughs> so it never goes away. We all have it and, and just strategies to deal with it. I, I agree with everything that's said. I, I think the other thing I would say is, and, and maybe I'm, I, I keep repeating myself, but talk with your colleagues too. I, I think in terms of one of the things, if, if you're if you don't have the skill, so I am not a theoretical econometrician or a stat side of stats. I like the problem solving aspect, and I um, I, I struggle with writing to a degree as well. And finding people who can help with that where I can take advantage of their comparative advantage, bring them into my projects or ask, ask if they have projects. So talking with those people and building those relationships. And, and I think to a degree, we have to do that ourselves. Um, and I know both jobs coming in, um, there weren't people stepping up all the time saying, 
hey, come work with us. It was, we had to walk into their office and talk with them and set up those relationships. And that was, I, I kind of had a similar experience with grad school to Amy a little bit, where I walked in my department doing, I was doing research no one else was doing. And even though I was an ag econ, and so I, I ended up doing a lot of the research myself and then graduating my dissertation and my committee was, you're done. Um, and so it, it, it was very much, uh, um, and so when I got into other positions, I didn't have that strong mentoring from my um, major professors. And so it was really, I had to learn how to build those relationships myself and self-advocate a little bit, I think. And it's both ways, build those so you can have that later on those shoulders to lean on a little bit because th those are invaluable in your career. And so, um, and get a diverse set of people. I, I, I'll push that a lot. Um, and so that, that, that's that been uh, awesome in my career. So I'll leave you with that. Great, so we're getting close to the time. So I'm gonna let Anne, will you ask your question? This is gonna be our final one for the hour. Yeah, and I'll try to do it quickly. Um, thanks so much. These are fantastic um, insights and just a lot of wisdom. So thank you guys. I'm wondering about this interplay between kind of you have ideas and you have collaborations and which do you let guide the other one and when and um, how do you think about sort of the relationship between your new ideas and your new collaborations um, and who to kind of who to work with on what? So I'll say first to start off, keep an idea book. They actually even say sometimes keep it next to your bed. Um, I have not done this and I wish I have. I have dreamed about co topics I've been thinking about and then my dreams, I'm like, wow, this would be awesome. And it, it does to write those down. And as you're doing them with discussions with other people, because you never know you'll come back to and you can flip through those. Just have it as like a, I keep it as like a diary book. Um, I, I think the other side too is um, I think your ideas, share them with other people. Think of them, how can I collaborate on an idea I have, especially if you're looking at collaboration for it. Because I think what you'll find is you'll have an idea, someone else will have an idea, and then they'll come together. Um, that's how a lot of the interdisciplinary research I do has. And it's talking with people in other disciplines um, and sharing like, I have this idea. I start going to talk to other people and it's very much kind of, they have their, they start bringing it in um, more into that. And so um, they start bringing in their own input and ideas into that. So I, it, it's kind of just talking. The more you talk, the more, more you'll get out of that. So. Quickly, I've done both. I have ideas and I seek out people who have complementary expertise, or I have people I just love to work with, and we get together and we brainstorm ideas. And I think either can work. Um, yeah. I don't know, Sierra, if you wanted to add something. Um, I've decided I'm too old for ideas. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I have a book. I have a book that I keep. Yeah. And so when an undergrad comes in, because I have small ideas a lot more than bigger ideas, right? So it's not grant, big grants, but, you know, like things that can be done in a semester or something. So when a student, an undergrad student comes in and says, I need a senior project or research project, I'm looking to go to graduate school. You know, what what do, what do you have? Those I, I can flip open and say, OK, I think we can get this done in a semester or a year, whatever, whatever that looks like. And so. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again to our panelists for your wonderful wisdom and sharing your stories. We appreciate it. And for everyone joining today to uh, accept that knowledge and take it and run with it. We appreciate your time. Thank you all. Thanks for organizing. Yes, thank Great you. Great moderating. Bye, thank everybody. You. Bye. Bye, everyone.